FPGA is a technology at crossroads. After decades of existence as a logic technology, FPGAs are today, you find them massively deployed in data centers and other compute settings. As a, in that sense, we are at a crossroads to more drastically re-envision the form and function of the FPGA technology. But this time, not as an alternative to ASIC. Right? The, quest, the pertinent question is, can we use programmable logic in a way that ASIC cannot? Right? This is to bring something new, something more powerful than ASIC in the building of a better data center server. So this is what the PIs of the Crossroad Research Center got together to do. And here you see, you know, we have a long list of names here on the slide, but for now, it's not so important you know our names. In fact, you probably know, we probably all know each other, but what we are really about. And if you look, right, the PIs, they come from three universities, but more importantly, was wide ranging background from high level data center networking and application to, you know, true nuts and bolts, logic fabric, architecture, circuit and tools. And we are joining forces in this center to bring a full stack of expertise that is really needed to rethink this question of a new FPGA architecture for data center servers. And I think I throw this word of architecture around, it will start to make sense once I introduce it. But for now, I would say, you know, we're really uh, excited about doing this work, and I hope maybe you will be too. So my presentation today will have three parts. I, I want to, you know, since it's an introduction, I want to start by first motivating the big picture, a very high level big picture goal and vision for the center. And once we've done that, then I will put forth our architectural concept for the Crossroad 3D FPGA, where we're starting from. And lastly, I will close by in, uh, introducing the broader research vectors that surrounds the 3D FPGA architecture. These are things to be carried out by the PI together toward the center's vision. So to get started, right? So my goal today is to help you understand the work of the center. I want you to understand it enough to pique your interest, to pique your imagination. Maybe you will send an email afterwards. Maybe you'll find something that you can do with that. That's what we want the center to be. And so to do that, right, I can't think of a better way than for me to start by posing to you, all of you, the very same question the PIs got together and asked ourselves in the beginning. Right, this really is the question that I started it all. This is not a story. This is the actual question we asked. What is the role of programmable logic in future data center servers? Right? What is the role of programmable logic in future data center servers? And I'd like you to think about this question for yourself. But I think yeah, I need to give you a little bit more context so we're at the same place. We are asking the question in the context of a network-driven, data-centric computing reality. Right? The balance of compute and data has shifted drastically from the old days of number crunching computing. Right? Performance nowadays has a lot more to do with bytes per second than MIPS or gigaflops. Right? And also, you know, it is as much value in holding data as processing them. But it, it is a different time. And also, is really no longer a center for the CPU to be central off, right? If you look at today's data center servers, if anything, right, a server has a front and the back. And at the front door is the network. The network is what's truly driving what the server does. The CPU, GPU, and the likes, you know, they really are, they're just reactionary resources 
sitting in the back, reacting to what the network wants. And so it's in this data center server context, context we ask that question. And so, yeah, with that said, you know, it probably doesn't surprise you now to see in my vision for a data center server, you know, I have the FPGA in the position of the new front and the center. Now, I, I should be careful here, right? As I suggested in the beginning, it is not an actual FPGA I want, at least not the kind that has to compete with ASICs or to be the target of arbitrary RTL netlist. So the FPGA we're talking about, right, will only have to be good at its defined role in the making of a better data center server, right? If we get to put aside the last 40 years of legacy baggage, what we want to keep is just FPGA's winning attributes. The good stuff, right? For lack of a better word, I'm going to call it FPGA ness. How do we introduce this FPGA ness into traditional server design doctrines that's classically limited to only hardware versus software? And what we want is to offer more than software. So we, of course, have to exploit FPGA's hardware derived attributes higher performance, better energy efficiency, and the ability to operate at individual bit and cycle granularity. It is hardware. But on the other hand, very important, right? This time around, programmability. The programmability of the FPGA shouldn't be something that we keep apologizing for to someone who really wanted an ASIC, right? This time, like, programmability becomes the feature, the reason, the very reason we want to add FPGA next to hardware, next to software in creating this better data center server. So that gives you a context and while you, you think about your answer to what you want your FPGA to do, let me tell you what the PIs thought about. And this is where we started, right? So in this, the title says past, but it's not so far past, right? If you open the latest edition of Hennessy and Patterson, the idea of a computer is still centered around just hardware and software. There is no FPGA, there is no re pro reconfigurable programmable logic. And the only place you might find Programmable hardware is when we use FPGAs to pretend to be hardware. And so in this still, this classic view, let's call it, right? The classic view, you know, we are trained to do as much as possible in software and only resort to hardware where software is not good enough, right? Whether it's in terms of performance, energy, or power. And this is the way we thought of we thought when we built PCs in the 80s, and you know, we really haven't moved away from that now in 2021. Now, to be fair, right, things have changed. And so today, there are more and more things where software is not good enough, right? whether it's because of tighter power constraints and underneath that, the need to get more and more performance. So the problem is when you start pushing too much, too many different things to hardware, hardware is not going to be good either, right? Imagine, you know, what should happen if the things that need to be done in hardware, right? Not get it out of software as ask hardware to do it, right? What if those things has to evolve? after the hardware has been designed or even already deployed into the data center, okay? Also, right, it is very wasteful if we try to build all the functionalities 
in hardware, if it, they are only going to be used one at a time in practice. So if we do look around today, right, for these reasons, right, we do, we, you know, we have been seeing many examples of FPGAs being introduced into today's servers, right, in the, in the sense to make hardware smarter, so to speak. But so far, it has been mostly ad hoc point solutions. So probably the most famous example is Microsoft. Right? If you take Microsoft, Microsoft got into FPGAs because software, software wasn't good enough. But if you say between ASIC versus FPGAs, yeah, I really don't think it was the case that Microsoft couldn't afford to build or buy ASICs. They took the FPGA route because they need it for granability. And in this case, right, FPGA was the unapologetic better answer. And that's where we need to be. And we can look at another example and for a different point. So if you look at Samsung, so we see that Samsung is starting to put FPGAs in front, adding them to SSD, solid state drives. Now, this is interesting because if you think about it, right, is it really that solid state drives need to be smarter? Or is it they just don't want to have to go all the way to the CPU, paying for the latency, paying for the energy to do every dumb little thing? Right. Why are they adding FPGA? And so we ask, how should it really be if we get to start on a clean sheet of paper? And so this is, I still consider the informal presentation so anyone can jump in and ask questions anytime. Um, I think you are able to unmute yourself. So for the future, right, clean slate. We, what we, the PIs, what we see for the future is where FPGAs are not just commonplace in data center servers, but actually becoming a permanent central fixture, an actual fixture in a new server architecture, right? An architecture dedicated to network driven data centric computing. And what we have come to call the Crossroads FPGA will serve as a literal crossroads of data at the center of the server, providing switching and, and processing. And it will do so in a programmable and active, programmable and active way without assistance from the CPU. And it will lend its smart to all the hardware, so hardware can go back to being single-minded commodity. We're not here to display CPUs or other processing means, right? The Crossroads FPGA will focus on providing processing of what we call data on the move, right? As data traverse through the Crossroads FPGA, going between different endpoints on the server, right? In this data-driven environment, we cannot stall or store the data. We just have to keep up. And if we can keep up, we're allowed to do something. And the goal here then is to be able to manipulate data while they are traversing to reduce the amount of work, the amount of storage, or the amount of bandwidth needed at the downstream point. And beyond that, right, there's also very interesting implications when you start introducing or interposing programmable logic in between places that didn't used to be. For example, between the CPU and VRAM, right? We can do something in, that, in this FPGA for performance, or we can do something to create a new, very fine-grained, custom programmable security model. 
putting programmable logic in a system of hardware and software. And so, right, by putting this crossroad FPGA in the middle as the literal data crossroad, this is occupying a very interesting, very powerful position. So again, all right, I want to emphasize what we're not talking about another FPGA. This is not evolving Stratix 10 or, or uh, Xilinx Ultra Scale. Right. What the center is, we're asking, it's how best to use programmable logic technology in computing in whatever form and in the form of our choosing. So, oops. Good one, give away the punchline there. One second, let me get back to where I was. Okay, so let me find myself, All right? And so if you think about what we're really trying to do, right? If the center is truly successful in finding and filling a new role for programmable logic in data center servers, right? The outcome is not an FPGA. We're really thinking in terms of a whole new server architecture to go with this new device. And, you know, to be even more ambitious, right? What we should be looking for, right? The true hallmark of success is a new socket on the motherboard of all future data center servers, right? So here I'm showing you, this is not a real thing, but a crossroads or XRD, we have a good acronym already. A Crossroads socket that having this socket will come to cement, truly cement FPGA status as a permanent fixture. It is a little ambitious, and we're not going to get there in three years. But you know, I would tell you this is where all the centers of TI wants to be headed with all seriousness, and so with that. This is kind of where I presented the big picture of what the center is about. And if there are any quick questions, now is a good time. Does anyone want to throw something at me? Everyone's being very polite. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting here amused by the everything old is new again thought of we used to have chips that were responsible for IO integration with the CPU that were separate and they've all been integrated on the CPU die now. Wait, are you talking about the channels or are you talking about something else? I'm talking about Northbridge, Southbridge. I see. No, so I thought you were talking about the IBM channels. No. Um, right, but yes, there is that, but I think programmability Sure. Right, this is not, it's not going to be fixed at all. This, we were, it is becoming a data centric system. And we need to be very efficient in how we touch data. And we have to do it in a bit level, cycle level, right? Because other kinds of things, we have solutions for those things. But then we need to bring programmability with it. So, I understand. Okay. This is uh, Uday from the performance group. I have two questions. One okay. is, can you comment on the uh, energy efficiency of FPGAs compared to, say, GPUs or uh, reconfigurable architectures? And the second question okay. is, uh, the virtualizability of FPGAs compared to virtualized GPUs, because virtualized GPUs, you could do the context switching in one millisecond now. So. Uh, I mean, that's sort of a competition that FPGAs will face in the data centers. A millisecond is a long time for FPGA. You asked a very good question. So we'll get through it, but the thing to remember, this is not an FPGA. I'm building this for this purpose. It doesn't okay. have to be slow or low energy, right? And so to give you an example, right? We, Intel came out with the NX FPGA. It's, you know, if you make it to purpose, it's just as efficient as GPUs. 
on those things only. And so, so you, you shouldn't be thinking that we're doing everything in soft logic. We want uh, the programmable aspect of it, but everything that's bread and butter is going to be transistors. And part of the architecture is about deciding what to commit in transistors and what to retain in programmability and how to present that programmability to the programmers. So it's not an FPGA. This is a whole architecture. James, question. Yeah. So, so this XRD is going to be uh, moving lots of data, right? So would, would, would it be part of the vision to have online, you know, uh, real-time data analytics and learning from that? Absolutely. All right. That's what we're here for. Absolutely. All right. There are things that it's already very well handled, and there are things that could be better done. And we're not competing, right? This is finding this, where do we put this programmable logic to the best effect? It will still be hardware, there will still be software. It's just like when we, I, you know, when we open, you know, edition 10 of Hennessy and Patterson, there should be hardware, software, programmable logic. It's part of the computing. That's what I want. So maybe let me move a little bit and then we, you know, we can have another pause when I go through. And so, you know, so I was talking about where we want to go. So that's pull back. You know, where are we starting from? And what I want to share with you now is kind of our starting architectural concept for this cross crossroads 3D FPGA. Okay, so yeah, we, we saw the slide once already. I, I just want to put it up again to remind you of the role and purpose of the Crossroads FPGA. It, it is not for RT, it's not an RTL netlist target. It's for a special purpose and purpose in a data center server. So namely, we're talking about data switching between server endpoints and inline processing on data that is on the move, right? And for that, we want to exploit FPGA's programmability to be flexible. I think this goes to the earlier point, right? But that doesn't mean we must try to shoehorn everything into soft logic, right? If there are bread and butter operations that's inherent, inherent to Crossroads role and purpose, of course, we want it in transistors, right? If there are things that would become too expensive to do in solve logic, then we absolutely have to harden these things in transistors to get the most efficient, high, highest performing implementation. And it is because we get to make this choice. We have a role and purpose. We get to make a choice. This is why I speak of an architecture. Right, the crossroad FPG has an architecture. It does not have to be good to does not have to do everything. It doesn't have to be, be good at everything. It just has to be very, very good at what is intended to do. And that's the starting point of our thinking. So, starting from the highest level view, um, from the get go, we adopted a 3D hybrid strategy to try to leverage the new advances in 3D integration. It's a future technology and we need to consider future um, under, underlying underpinning technology as well. So if you look in this 3D stack organization, on the top die, that's the logic fabric. Here, we just want to track current commercial fabric design, right? We don't want to reinvent a better logic fabric. I don't think we, you know, the center TI, I don't think we can, I don't think we should. Now, to the extent, right, if I look at Intel Stratic Sense Fabric, I look at the quarter's tools, to the extent those things are parameterized, we may want to play with adjusting the balance 
changing the balance between logic, between memory, between wires, to change the balance a little bit to tailor to the crossroads application. But there is no need to invent, for us at least, to invent a better fabric. Intel anxieties can keep doing that. Where we're coming in, right? The place of, on the top at least, the place of the greatest, most significant departure in the fabric is the use of network on chip, especially for long haul data transfer across the die. And I'm gonna come back to this later, but here, I just wanna point out, if you look in this 3D architecture, the NLC will be pushed onto the base time. We don't want to disrupt the logic fabric. And so on the logic fabric, we want to, at most, we want to have the on-ramp, off-ramp to the NLC. And in general, we want to push as much as possible any of the crossroads specific hardened features, those, those things we have to make in transistors, we want to put those on the base die. So the top die, the logic fabric, and the EA tools, they stay in common with other Intel FPGAs. So in asking this question, right, the question of architecting the crossword FPGA, it mostly has to do with selecting and specializing hard blocks to go on the bottom. And here, the general strategy is to have streamlined hard blocks without bells and whistles, right? We want the basic model. We want the basic model to hit performance and efficiency targets that we can reach with soft logic. And because we have soft logic and hard logic, we, we can, at the end, leverage soft logic to, in addition, separately provide highly specialized case-by-case -case customization at the end. And so in thinking about an FPGA architecture, besides the, the baking architecture, the kind that we used to think about for CPUs, right? Like, instead of thinking everything has to be baked in and hardened absolutely once and for all, we should think of a more fluid notion of architecture that incorporates a library of solved logic options, functionalities and interfaces. So to go from that high level strategy, then I like to kind of get into a little bit more detail on three research focus, right? That's driven by the role that we have defined for the crossroads at PGA. So the, the first thing I want to talk about is the NLC. Then the second thing is we want to talk about the hard block selection for the base die. And lastly, I want to get into the support for partial recon reconfiguration and virtualization. I think that was one of the questions asked earlier. So I'm gonna to try to cover these. I can't go into great details, I'll try. And I'm sure we'll have more talks on these down the road. So coming to NLC, why NLC, network on chip? Yeah, I don't think it's even controversial to be asking for an NLC for FPGAs in 2021. It's, you know, some FPGA had them already. And in our context, right, crossword applications in particular, crossword applications will not be monolithic RTL netless. That's not what this is for. The applications and FPGAs nowadays, in general, they're just, they're, they're already too big to be designed like that. So the crossword applications as computing applications, right? they really lend themselves very well to modular constructions and abstract interfacing. So for us, right, looking at what the application is gonna be like, right, for moving data objects, we're moving data, we're moving data objects, we're not connecting wires, sending signals. Right, so to move data object between modules on the fabric, right, NLC is a much more efficient transfer option in terms of bandwidth and energy, and maybe even in ease of use. And as a systematic interconnect, 
NLC is also a natural place for us to be putting in the, the enforcement of virtualization and isolation when we get into thinking about multi-tenant usage of the FPGA. Um, integral to the same thinking is also that by taking today's you know, 18 hours compiled big design, we want to deconstruct them into NLC decoupled modules, right? No longer does the design have signal that go across the die. No longer do we build single large design that takes up the whole die. Then the design tools will now have these smaller scope entities. They, they will also have a much easier time working with these decoupled smaller design modules. Now, separate for thinking about what the NLC, how the NLC is needed for the logic, the fabric, like remember the NLC in this usage is, is also needed as a data switch. It is the data plane to switch the traffic between different server endpoints, right? This is that data on the move I brought up earlier on. It's important, central to this, to this thinking. And as these data on the move is switched to crossroads, part of the process, you know, part of the traversal can include being routed to solve logic on top or to hardware accelerator blocks on the bottom for inline processing. And right, with all that, right, in contrast to the kinds of NLC you might find on an Intel multi-core, right? The NLC we're talking about will be connecting up a much more diverse set of endpoints. But it is not good enough to simply respin current NLC know how exactly. And as kind of initial proposal, we need an approach that's both hierarchical and extensible, right? in what is to cater to the requirements of the disparate endpoints to their different traffic patterns, to their different performance and quality of service requirements. So here, right, if you look on the bottom, there's a cartoon on the bottom. So again, we still have the top die and bottom die organization. So on the right, that's the bottom die. That's where the NOC lives. And what I'm showing you is a two-level network, right? There's a a fatter, this fatter level two trunk network. And if we borrow from a row system OT, right, this level two trunk network is like the long haul highway system to get around the die globally. And this trunk, at level two trunk network, of course, it's also the backbone of the server data plane. In addition to the level two trunk, we have the level two regional. Right? We're taking this row system OT a little bit far. Right? So this regional network, right, compared to the freeways, these are the local highways. And therefore connecting regionally the hardened memory blocks, the accelerators on the bottom for them to interact. And I, I, you know, I need to warn you, right? So this is a cartoon. So don't take the topology too seriously, right? What I know is the topology will almost certainly not be regular or symmetric. This is the best I can draw. And point is, it doesn't have to be, right? We will have to look at what we eventually choose to lay out on the bottom die, who they need to talk to, how much bandwidth between different endpoints. Once we have a dedicated purpose, we get to design to that purpose, to be efficient for that purpose. We don't need to be good for everything. Now, on the bottom left, I know you, you guys, when I do this, is that left for you? So on the bottom left, this left, I'm showing now the top day. And what I mentioned before is, right, the top day is a fabric, and you will have the NLC, the on-ramp and off-ramp, interspersed periodically on this fabric. 
So the soft logic module can use the NOC to communicate by right, directly accessing the raw interface of the, the network on chip. Now, what we intend for more commonly is that soft logic modules will actually go through a level zero, right? There's a level zero soft logic network extension. And again, going back to the, the row system motif, these are the surface streets. This is for you to share the bandwidth capacity of a NLC on ramp. And, but more than that, right, more than a data transport interface, we can also provide through a library of soft logic extensions that embodies processing, embodies application specific functionality. So, for example, to convert the raw interface of the NLC into something specialized to the application, for example, streaming. NLC can be one paradigm. The user may want another. We can do the conversion in the last mile. That's not inefficient. And we can also do things like to actually do some lightweight processing, reformatting or parsing, or something heavier way having to do with data structures, special purpose data structures. And so this, right, this view of NLC, it's, it goes back to that example. Uh, it's a good example of the hyper strategy I put up earlier, right? We want the true hardware, the transistor hardware, to be very high performing, but single-minded because we have soft logic to augment, to, predict, to provide the flexibility we need. And that's, you know, that's a, a unifying thing throughout the design, the thinking of the Crossroad 3D FPGA. Right, so right, coming from the NLC, right, we are, we're, we're taking a hyper approach, right? This NLC itself is an ex one um, example of the hardened IPs we have to choose to become part of the Crossroad FPGA architecture to serve its role and purpose. And so in a more general investigation, we will have to look beyond NLC and look at the selection and the design of other hardened IPs to go also on the bottom dive. Now, NLC is obvious. I think, you know, we started, you know, when we started, we knew we needed it, right? For well, what Crossroad wants to do and how FPGAs are today, we need, we need that. But then we, for the rest, we'll have to now, we also need to look at the needs of, more generally, at the needs of the Crossroad application. And now looking at the, the catering to, it is catering to the data-centric task. And I think it's John asked, you know, we're gonna give a lot of emphasis, number one, to networking, and number two is machine learning analytics. Now, in looking at this role and purpose, what does it need to do? What does it need to do well in? Besides the application, part of the thinking also needs to look at the application programmers. And part of this I'm thinking about is the virtualization support. How to make the programmer happy to make the device useful. Right? We can't put everything on the bottom die. And in choosing what to harden to include, which also means what not to include, right? We're looking for functionalities that are universally or nearly universally needed. And I'll see a good example. With a high return on investment or alternatively functionality that are just too expensive to fake and solve logic. You know, I keep on going back to NLC as an example of this. But I want to emphasize, right? You shouldn't rule on x86 as something fitting this description that we want to harden on the bottom die. Right? That's it's not just this FPGA can have hardware, this FPGA can also have software. It's all to the architecture, to the purpose, to the role. 
Okay, so now part, besides picking what the IPs are, a big part of the bottom that design is then how best to present these hardened resources to the cross applications residing in the soft logic. It needs to be used. It needs to be a part of the application. And the NLC right, will play a big role in virtualizing the, the hardened bottom die resources right, as they are shared by the top die modules and will be in a location independent way. Soft logic anywhere on the fabric should have access to resources on the bottom. But on the other hand, right, there are times where you need more than that then there should also be a way where we can schedule, we can co-locate SoftWatch module to overlap with the resource that it needs, top and bottom, then they can communicate in through low latency, high bandwidth, direct connection through the, through the DAI. And we need to cover all, both cases. So you know, there is a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of variable in this decision-making, right? So this is, Starting with a strategy, the only way to foresee is by having an application-driven quantitative methodology. And so this is, you know, really we're talking about investigating the return on investment of alternatives. So here, like for example, you know, let's assume, let's assume we have already decided that hash tables or some kind of content-based lookup is important for networking application. How do we support it in this architecture, right? There are many different things we could harden to make a better hash table than we could on today's fabric. Do we need to put TCAM, content addressable memories on the bottom die? Or is more SRAM help with soft logic good enough already? You know, since we have a clean slate, we could elevate the whole IP to the level full-fledged. It's a hash table. It's that important. We're going to give you a hash table, right? Or we can even go higher. We can build a, a P4 batch action pipeline if that's what we're really headed towards. All right. So ultimately, to understand all the different return investment, right, it will require detailed studies of fully developed application from different application classes. These are not micro benchmark driven studies. And we need to be able to prototype them on the existing fabric and then to test them on detail, um, detail enough simulators. We're gonna do simulation studies for FPGA. Because right, we need to be able to play with, we need to be, we need to be able to play what if with enough detail. And so, Right, the, it, as we talk about a center, why I focus on the architecture, you know, later on I'll come back to like the development of the application studies and the simulator, the fabric simulator, these are all integral to what the center needs to do, right? This is, it's not an FPGA, and it's not just about the FPGA. The center is a whole architecture, it's a whole ecosystem. So, I I won't go into the second example, right? I think it's the, sorry about that. Let me just get back to where I am. So I have, I have a question. It's, okay, yes, please. Tool chain wise, um, mm -hmm. where do you first see the MLIR initiatives and others mapping into this? Um, hold that thought for a little bit. I'm gonna come back to that in a few okay. slides, okay? All right, so I think I want to go a little faster. So let's not get to the second example. And, but I think I just want to reiterate, right? So because the hybrid strategy is a disposition, we favor simple common denominator hardened primitives and then use the soft logic to augment the hardened features to provide customization, right? It's the right kind of separation of concerns. So I want to get to... I'm running slower than I thought. I thought I was doing okay. Um, but this is the thing I care about the most. This is where I have a personal stake in. All right. This is time for something more controversial. All right. So 
What I'm looking at here, number three, is architectural changes to give better support to partial re reconfiguration and fabric virtualization. And to date, FPD designers are predominantly trained with the same mindset as ASIC designers. Even though FPGAs are programmable, we treat it like it's not. So if you look on the left, say we fill out the fabric with modules one, two, and three. If it turns out module one, two, and three are never used together, just one at a time over time, that's just too bad, right? This is so wrong. FPGAs are programmable. What a regional logic fabric, what is used for, can change over time, and we should change it over time. So if module one, two, three are only used one at a time, we should map them to reuse the same region. I can get the same performance for less area. And if you have the mindset, it'd be a lot more intuitive if you're already off the mindset that there is someone else around that can use the free space, right? There can be someone else, there should be someone else. This is the new FPGA. And separately on the bottom, I'm also showing it something different, right? I can have different implementation of one, two, three, each one using up the whole fabric for better performance. That can have different trade-offs. And with programmable logic, there's nothing that says I can't have both. I can have both systems prepared. I can run one during the day. I can run a different one at night to get different trade-offs, right? FPGA doesn't have to be static. FPGA doesn't have to pretend to be ASICs anymore. This is where we want to get to. And so, you know, if I had the time, I could give you a whole talk on this, but this is where I'm doing a lot of my research going into. But here, I just quickly point to the architectural support having to do with PR and resource virtualization. And again, that this NLC keeps coming back. NLC is going to be a big part of this as well. So at the fabric level, yeah, I want to ask that more care is given to keep the fabric tiles uniform. So PR module, the bit strings, can be relocatable. Right? It doesn't need to be arbitrary placement. It will go a long way if relocation is possible at the granularity of whole tiles. And then with the NLC, NLC can provide this location independent interaction with things outside of a module. And I think we're running short on time. I'm going to hold back on the details, but I'll just say that, right? In to get to this kind of dynamism and flexibility, the most interesting bits are in the runtime system and programming abstraction. It's not in the hardware. The hardware we know how to do. We need to know what to do with it and how to let programmers deal with it. And that's definitely a different talk. So I'm gonna now try to wind down. There is a third part, but the third part is closing. So yeah, here we go, okay? If you build it, they will come. So you know, people old enough seen this movie. Right? This is the dream. If you build it, they will come. Unfortunately, this is not a movie. Right? So I talked about the Crossroads 3D FPGA is the vision. It's our dream. But I think I already alluded to a little bit. By itself, the FPGA, the device, it's not going to change the world. It will take a whole village. Right? When we say if you build it, they will come. This day are the users, the programmers. They're only going to come if they see a reason to come. There has to be a value. It's better. Their life is better somehow. And programmers will only build application to crossroads if they actually have a way to do that. Right? That's not the equivalent of climbing Mount Everest. So today's talk has been about the crossroad FPGA, the it, if you will. We built it. Right. But if you look at what I'm showing you, the whole center, it's actually only one slice of the pie. There are five research vectors being pursued by the center together to try to change the big picture. 
So I want to point out on the top, we have a research vector. We call them RVs, this RV1, research vector one, dedicated to studying applications to determine the right usage, the right programming models, and to identify how programmable logic can add value in, the, in those data center applications. And I think this is a question asked earlier, right? Three of the RVs on the bottom, right? These are all to make sure whatever we built is it. There is a humanly possible way to develop an application for it, right? Starting from a, a brand new, a new 3D CAD flow to a high level overlay based application framework and to a dynamic runtime system. And these are all being pursued together by the center's PI. Wow, I'm running really late. Give me a couple more minutes. And so now hopefully it makes sense to see why we have for FPGA Center, we had PI from all of these different walks of life. We have FPGA people you recognize, people like Vaughn, Derek, and, and David, but then we also have VS, Justine, and Front. They're not FPGA people, but they're not strangers to FPGA. We have been working together for a very long time. Right? This, this idea of crossroads didn't happen suddenly. Right? It's, it congealed its convergence of what the PIs have been talking about actually working together for many years including the student, right? So the center is only a few months old, but we're actually fully powered. We're rolling with students because they've been working on it for a very long time. It's just before they were working separately, but now we have a center. We can all get together and go towards the same end. So, you know, this is gonna be a very exciting ride for everyone. Running really short on time, but I must acknowledge the program team from Intel VMware. Uh, from Intel, we have Melissa, Erica, Dasu, and Mahesh. I think if you work with Intel, you know these people. They're very, very active. From VMware, we have David Ott and Andreas Novacek. And you know, they have been absolutely wonderful in connecting us with the right stakeholder within the company. And I think in a way, the center is quite different. And we should talk more about this offline, right? It is a a different, it's, it's a really good model for how industry and academia can collaborate. So that's something for later. So let me very quickly wrap up. I, this is the last slide, I promise. So to sum up, right, what I wanted to do is to convey to you the high level mission, right? The mission to define and to fill a new role for programmable logic in future data center servers. So we're not here to compete or replace traditional FPGAs, right? Crossroads is a different breed of device with a dedicated purpose and application. We're not here to displace traditional hardware or software, right? We are here to introduce programmable logic's unique strength, adding it to hardware and software to make a better server design. So to look for, and part of looking this answer for the future, right? It is important we look at technology underpinning of the futures. So the 3D integration is something that's very important part of the, the driving forces. And one last thing to mention, right? So this is one thing that's unique to the center, right? From the very start, right? The, the center was funded with a commitment to publicly disseminate results. Right. All the output of the center will be made public and open source for everyone, and not just Intel VMware. And this is actually what Intel VMware asked for. They made us do it. And so you know, I encourage you to go look to the website, and one thing that's already, already available is this 100 gigabit FPGA accelerated intrusion detection system. It's quite interesting. And actually, if you wait until the end of summer, a 2.0 will come out, and that will be a different talk. And I think this is a good place to stop. It is 3.01. I'm sorry about running over a little bit.